All right, everyone, welcome back from your lunch. We hope that you had a nice break, a nice stretch, a nice meal, whatever floats your boat. We are excited to continue with the next block, which will be called Modern Treatment, Personalized Health and Self-Care. And sorry for butchering the pronunciation there. Uh, so we have a really nice lineup with uh, some nice variations in the presentations there. But before we do that, Martin would like to say a few more words about the quiz we ran before lunch. Yeah, it felt a little bit like we were rushing over the big celebration of uh, the winner of our quiz. So uh, we can now announce that the winner is uh, a local. It's Henrik Hedner working at the Heart Failure Bus here in Gothenburg, so Jatbussen, which is also part of the program tomorrow. So if you're interested to know more about what Henrik is doing, uh, you should listen in to uh, Sara and Helle's presentation tomorrow. But um, big congratulations to you, Henrik. We promise to arrange uh, the prize for you in good order. Excellent. So the upcoming uh, program is that first, Professor Minna Pikkarainen will be speaking to us about personalized digital health. Then that will be followed by Sara Riggare and Andreas Hellström talking about patient research, followed by Matthias Vade, who will tell us about the robot Isolde who is a humanoid, humanoid robot for social distancing. But first of all, let's welcome Minna. Thank you very much for being here today. Oh, Minna, your uh, microphone is muted. Thank you so much. I'm very happy to be here today. Uh, well, mm -hmm. well very happy I to have you. see my screen or? We can see your screen. Now we just need it to be presenter mode and we're good to go. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, or? it looks good. Oh, uh, Mina, one little thing. Our uh, technician asks if you would like to. Uh, our technician asked if you would like to lean a bit closer to the microphone, just to mm -hmm. make sure that we pick you up clearly. And you need to. Awesome. You need to do. Better the, now. Yes, much better. And you need to do the, the same um, uh, swap as we did during the test. Swap presenter view to yeah, exactly yeah. there. And yes. now it looks okay. Yes, looks beautiful. Yes. Okay, thank you. Please go ahead. Okay, so so welcome everybody. So uh, my name is uh, Minna Pikkarainen and I'm professor of uh, digital health. I just uh, started in uh, Chalmers at the beginning of this year. So in Chalmers, I'm, I'm pretty new. Uh, before uh, Chalmers, I was actually working as a professor of connected health uh, in Finland, in between Oulu University and VDD Technical Research Center of Finland. So I will tell you a little bit uh, about personalized healthcare and self-care that we have been doing in Finland, and then uh, a little bit what we are now working on in, in Chalmers. So that's, that's uh, the kind of agenda of my presentation today. Our, we all know that our healthcare system has uh, quite uh, traumatic problems nowadays. We have uh, like a triple amount of elderly people coming by 2050 and, and double amount of chronic diseases by 2030. And in this situation, um, we have this COVID uh, in our places as well. And uh, this uh, capacity of healthcare uh, is not really enough to take care of uh, all these people. And we can see that uh, these healthcare providers, hospitals, uh, they have been doing a lot of uh, work, like uh, years and years of time already, trying to uh, like be as efficient as, as possible, uh, having all kinds of uh, lean improvement uh, practices there. But it's uh, actually easily then leading to this kind of uh, routine care where all the patients are taking care of the similar ways. And uh, this digitalization, uh, digital uh, medical devices and, and digital solutions is actually the way that we could build this kind of personalized uh, care, uh, citizen-centric uh, solutions and uh, how to do this uh, in a way that we can still be kind of efficient in the hospital site uh, or, or healthcare provider site. That's uh, actually the big mission that we have currently in this field. Uh, what can we do then? Of course, we can bring these uh, different uh, technologies, uh, digital solutions, but we should also empower people to uh, do their own uh, care. 
And we can actually see this um, actually happening already. So if we look at the uh, hip and knee surgeries, like before, uh, people were spending like one week at the hospital after one, one surgery, but nowadays they are getting back home at the same time, same day. And uh, basically uh, they are then expected to do all these rehabilitation activities by themselves at home. And uh, in order to, to be efficient in that, we need some kind of technological support empowering people in this. Uh, also, if you look at the, the uh, prevention sites, we could actually, there are already evidence and proof that uh, these technologies could be used to prevent these chronic diseases even happening if we could just somehow change the behavior of the people. But uh, it's, uh, of course, uh, more easy to, to say than to be really done. But we can see that, for instance, uh, in the case of diabetes type 2, uh, there has been a lot of uh, kind of uh, evidence that uh, people are not getting these, these sicknesses if uh, we could somehow help with them, with these technologies. So uh, what we should focus is uh, this personalized uh, care services, uh, citizen-centric uh, care, but also to this kind of professional decision support systems, which are using the data in order to uh, help the professionals to do uh, decisions that are helping our citizens, patients, but also uh, which are um, like uh, uh, bringing this, this kind of efficiency that we need in the healthcare at this point of time. And all this should be, of course, linked to the care pathways, where I mean that, uh, for instance, uh, we have been looking at the surgery care uh, before hospital, during hospital and after hospital, like looking the whole care pathway instead of one step of the processes. And how can we bring these technologies and digital solutions to support the whole care pathway in a kind of consistent and coherent uh, ways uh, from the patient? Uh, perspective, because in the end, this hospital uh, like moment here in, in that uh, journey is, is very short amount of time. And most of the most of the things actually happen before and after that at home. So what is then uh, digital health? Uh, digital health, um, it's actually a pretty complex uh, term and we can find more than 30 different definitions about it in the, in the literature. And one of the reasons is this uh, HIMSS uh, definition, uh, which is actually bringing uh, three aspects in the digital health. One is that we need to think about these different technologies that we bring in, but we also need to uh, make sure that these technologies will support this kind of improved healthcare deliveries. And that we have to also make sure that this uh, whole system transformation is taken into account in this overall uh, puzzle in a way. I have been also doing some research very recently, like what is actually digital health because the term was not so uh, well defined. We did uh, 30 interviews uh, to uh, medical uh, experts, to, to industrial experts and, and uh, these experts in the digital health field. And uh, our definition of the digital solution is that uh, we are actually doing all kind of uh, health interventions, coaching solutions uh, to support either citizens or, or healthcare professionals. And we should make them in a way that uh, they are generating the data, which is then uh, like analyzed by different algorithms and AI technologies, and then return back to these uh, people and, and healthcare professionals in a more meaningful ways so that we can uh, help people also in the remote areas and to, to uh, provide better care uh, with uh, better like uh, efficiency uh, perspective as well. And then another finding uh, of our study was that uh, instead of, of uh, looking just uh, uh, like making uh, technologies for patients or making technologies for healthcare professionals, we should work together as an ecosystem of researchers, companies, healthcare uh, providers, and, and uh, like taking into account this patient perspective as well, in order to uh, make sure that these technologies that we develop are actually really uh, user-driven and, and citizen 
centric and uh, they will be used in the in the real life situations as well. As, as a connected health professor, um, I have been recently uh, working in, in four main projects and, and two of them uh, were uh, funded by Business Finland and, and uh, two, two of them were funded by, by EU. Um, and I'm telling you a couple of examples of the projects that I was working and, and this personalized uh, uh, healthcare uh, in those projects, how it was actually built together with this ecosystem uh, players. So uh, this uh, one uh, project called ICORI, it was started actually 2016 when we uh, were interviewing uh, healthcare professionals and uh, medical and, and uh, patients in our university hospital, where we were identifying what kind of needs there are in this kind of pediatric uh, surgery care where uh, families are coming to, to the surgeries with their children. And we found out that there is actually a need uh, that this kind of solutions which are covering the whole care pathway, uh, looking like uh, pre-hospital period, during hospital, and then after hospital. And then we collected a consortium of different players, companies uh, who can uh, really make these solutions into this care pathway uh, together with uh, uh, two hospitals in Finland. So we started this uh, work, uh, like discussing with the clinicians in the orthopedic uh, unit of the old university hospital. And uh, they told us that um, they have been like years and years of time really emphasizing this, uh, this uh, like uh, efficiency in the care, um, because they know that uh, now they have hundreds of patients coming to the orthopedic surgeries, but after a few years, there will be thousands of patients and they were very concerned about the patient experience in this uh, kind of situation. And then we talked with the Helsinki University Hospital, which were just moved to this kind of brand new, beautiful building. And uh, they also, uh, they have put different specialized care units together and they were worried about the patient experience in this case. So we started the work with uh, systematic literature reviews, trying to understand like uh, what kind of solutions there are actually already existing for the adult orthopedic care and, and pediatric surgery care, if you look at the whole care pathway. And we found out that uh, for the adult orthopedic care, we can uh, find solutions in the post-operational situations. And for the uh, children side, uh, like children's surgery care, we find, found solutions only for this pre-hospital period. And uh, basically, uh, we use this uh, as a baseline information um, um, when we designed this kind of interview studies uh, where we went to, to interview patients and, and medical experts uh, in uh, Finland and also in Singapore, trying to understand what kind of needs and challenges uh, there really are in this surgery care, care, care pathways. And we brought these ideas into this uh, as a requirements uh, for these companies. And uh, together with, with uh, these hospital players, companies from Finland, but also we took these companies to Singapore and we worked with uh, four hospitals there. We uh, created these kind of concepts for the future solutions. And then we designed these randomized control trials in order to understand what are the impacts of these solutions. And the outcomes of these were a little bit different, uh, depending on the on the hospital and uh, clinicians uh, kind of needs and, and interest. But we were looking like how are these solutions affecting into the quality of life of the patients, for instance, and also hospital efficiency. And these are examples of the solutions that we created. So we make this kind of uh, a mobile uh, solution, uh, which was also using AI there as a, as a behind like um, for the for, the, for this orthopedic care patients for the breast cancer patients in in singaporean hospital uh, some solution for for children as well and then uh, this kind of free happy testing game and some uh, service robots that were used in the hospital so we uh, actually published uh, more than 20 publications out of this uh, study so you can find a lot if you want to check more carefully what has been done. So we started with this kind of ecosystem of Finnish players and we end up to this kind of ecosystem of international players working together in this. 
Then we wanted to repeat the same exercise in some other context. So I went to talk to this uh, neurologist in all university hospital and Wopi University Hospital, and they told that uh, there has been a lot of uh, these kind of new devices uh, coming uh, for this uh, like uh, stroke uh, care, and uh, they were interested to to see if these new uh, sensor devices could be used uh, to improve this uh, stroke uh, diagnostics uh, somehow, and also the stroke rehabilitation process in these rehabilitation hospitals uh, in Finland. So we also created a consortium of, of, uh, of companies and, and uh, hospitals in Finland. We received uh, all together um, like uh, 57 million uh, like, uh, Swedish crowns uh, funding for, for this, and I was leading this project actually before coming to, to Chalmers. And uh, in this project, we were uh, co-creating uh, like together with, with companies and these healthcare professionals solution, uh, which is uh, now, for, first of all, we had some solutions for the uh, diagnostic side and some solutions for this, uh, uh, which were targeted for the, for the patient when uh, they have had uh, either TIA or stroke attack uh, given for them already in the hospital, but then uh, which can be then continuously used uh, in the re rehabilitation period. And also when they are back home uh, from, the, from the hospital. And uh, this is uh, something which is uh, currently ongoing uh, in Finland even now. So what we did, we repeated very similar process where we uh, first, uh, we actually had remote workshops because of the COVID with all these players together in order to understand this care pathway and, and needs of different uh, phases of that. Then we did systematic literature reviews, uh, qualitative interviews. They're actually uh, just proceeding with those now. And then uh, there's this solution co-creation uh, now ongoing. And we also uh, did some data collection pilot, uh, like collecting data in order to uh, create uh, these AI-based solutions for, for these uh, diagnostic uh, purposes. So, but, but then uh, if, if we move uh, what uh, I'm actually now uh, working in, in Chalmers, so of course, um, we, we are using this uh, previous uh, uh, experiences, uh, but uh, we have been also discussing a lot uh, with, uh, with uh, different people in, in Chalmers, and it seems that Chalmers has uh, like a long history uh, of uh, really excellent e-health uh, research and a lot of uh, different technologies has been built there. And uh, what we want to do is actually to, to continue this excellent work uh, in, in Chalmers, uh, looking at this personalized care and uh, clinical decision support uh, aspects. And also, how can we link this to the care pathways, uh, improving treatments uh, in also in the Swedish hospitals, and um, like uh, how to improve this uh, rehabilitation uh, perspectives that we kind of already started uh, also in Finland. And then uh, what we are looking is is uh, how can we use this kind of heterogeneous data from different uh, sources large data sets and AI to support these uh, solutions and, and uh, personalized care and also uh, how can we get into this kind of sustainable uh, healthcare where uh, these uh, technologies will be real really in, in, in the U um, after our projects and by the, by the people. So if we go back to this uh, digital health uh, frame, um, I can actually see that uh, in Chalmers, we have a lot of uh, this kind of uh, very interesting uh, technologies uh, developed, um, uh, which are offering a possibility to, to have uh, like a different variety of, of data that uh, can be then uh, like collected uh, in this, uh, this uh, pilots uh, together with the hospitals and, and companies and then used as a baseline for this uh, AI solution uh, co-creation. And what we want to do also is to combine this uh, biomedical engineering with ICT and uh, this uh, uh, healthcare uh, medical research that uh, I have been also doing in my past uh, projects uh, successfully before. 
And, uh, but uh, this is uh, technology perspective only is not enough. We also have to uh, take care that we really understand the real needs of these uh, patients and the, and the medical experts. And uh, also we have to link this to this uh, care pathways. And that's something that we have been also starting to, to look uh, already together. And uh, of course, uh, we need to involve uh, these uh, clinical experts and patients continuously in this uh, solution co-creation that we do uh, together with our researchers. And uh, that's not enough itself, but also we have to uh, make sure that we are aware of these policy level activities um, like regulations that are, are happening uh, in Swedish side and also be very well linked to those uh, like all the time. So um, we are looking uh, research in the prehab hospital care. Uh, how can we support these care processes, but also care at home in, in the remote locations in, in Sweden and also in the uh, global scale. Uh, what we have been now uh, working on, actually today we just uh, submitted one uh, Swedish Research Council uh, application um, which is related to this uh, kind of uh, smart uh, uh, decision making uh, solutions for uh, stroke situations. And what we want to do is, is to focus on the real life uh, problems. And here we uh, actually uh, we were discussing these uh, stroke specialists in Sweden. And they said that um, it's actually uh, there are some uh, time delays uh, in this uh, pre-hospital uh, uh, care of, of uh, stroke patients. So uh, that's something that we wanted to uh, really improve with this, uh, this uh, proposal that we made uh, with this uh, more uh, advanced uh, decision support system, which is using the heterogeneous data from the different uh, sources. Um, so here's just an uh, example, a picture of, of uh, our project and, and bigger vision that we have been creating together with a uh, few companies and, and hospitals uh, in Sweden. So the idea is that uh, how can we use uh, like uh, data from uh, videos in the ambulances, stroke finders and some vital uh, signs, uh, electronic health records and registers uh, to support this decision making of stroke patients, just uh, give you one example. And this is also something that uh, we are looking here. So how can we help uh, this uh, care at home environment? And uh, here there's this um, uh, area of advanced initiative, which is just, just uh, started and uh, we are working here together. Uh, also with a similar approach that we have been doing before in, in Finland uh, as well. So looking this uh, ecosystemic uh, perspective and also looking the real needs uh, in the care pathway and, and uh, people and, and clinicians and then uh, building up uh, different uh, projects uh, on top of this and fundings in order to support this kind of concrete personalized uh, solution uh, development in this particular area and field. So here uh, we have been starting to work together with um, Ben Karne and um, also with, uh, with some uh, digital health uh, team in, in Chalmers. And uh, uh, it has been really, really nice and pleasant to, to work with all these, these people. And uh, our target is really to, to uh, make some uh, bigger portfolio of the projects and get some, some uh, bigger impact in this particular area um, together with all these, these uh, people. So thank you so much for listening and I'm happy to answer to any questions that you have. Thank you very much, Mina. Kitos. So we do actually have one question that has come in from our audience and uh, the question is, uh, I think it's related to the efforts you've put in with defining digital health from the academic perspective. So the question is, do you know of any studies looking at how patients define digital health? Well, that's actually a very good, good question because uh, we, in, in our case, we are more looking at, uh, <laughs> at um, how uh, these professionals and, and companies and, and the researchers are defining digital health, but 
No, we haven't actually checked that that perspective, and that would be actually very very interesting. Maybe further uh, next uh, study to do um, after after this one. Yeah, writing right now together. So yeah, very good point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I I sort of picked up that there's a a little bit of a gravitational. Um, like the, the weight is on the foot of senior citizens. And I did see the word children, of course, but I'm curious to know, is the digital health, uh, like this portfolio, is it about primarily senior patients who are sort of in the healthcare system because of a, uh, a, a problem or a need? Or is it also including senior citizens in general? Because I'm curious to know, when do you start getting them comfortable with this new way of accessing and communicating with healthcare? Um, I think um, we need to, of course, as, as I said in the in the beginning of presentation, we will have uh, so many elderly people to, to take care, and, and all of them has to be taken care uh, somehow. And uh, what we have been looking at, uh, this elder care moves home, for instance, is, is this uh, perspective that um, people uh, who are at home, they need some kind of continuous uh, monitoring to, especially in the remote areas, to feel safe. And if something happens, we need some kind of uh, system solutions, uh, uh, some kind of processes in place to, to treat them as, as uh, best possible way as, as, uh, as, as possible in this, this situation with the limited uh, capacity that uh, we have. So how to how to actually arrange that? And I have been before uh, talking also with the, this emergency care uh, experts, and they told us that actually it's it's uh, it can be these borderline cases it can be very very tricky because uh, it might be that people have a little bit diseased, bad feeling, and then they're not sure whether they ambulance should, should leave them and, and uh, whether they can just stay at home and, and uh, what if something happens again, uh, like uh, how can we help these people? So these are the examples of the situations that we want to, to solve here somehow. So how to provide this kind of uh, monitoring for the people to, to feel safe in this kind of uh, situations. Hmm. Okay. We have a follow-up question to the one that came previously. Um, do the studies that you've been involved in evaluate both quality and quantity of digital healthcare? As in, does it decrease or increase the burden on regular healthcare? Mm, that's a, <laughs> it's a very good question. Whether it's, uh, I think it should uh, decrease the burden of the of the regular healthcare. That's how I see it, but. Uh, uh, I think it's also coming to this this um, requirement that we should, if we build, for instance, these decision support systems, we should really uh, make them uh, like user driven. So, uh, like in Finland, I saw this emergency care, uh, like acute uh, doctors who were um, like in this critical situation, they had to open like five different systems in order to get enough data to make a decision. So um, if you want to decrease this burden, we should really make solutions that are uh, user centric and user driven in a way that, uh, that they are easy to, that they're making their, their work easier instead of, of uh, taking their time. So maybe, maybe that's the, the way to um, like, find the balance and do it in the right way. Mm -hmm. um, I also know that uh, we have a very mixed audience right now. Many of them are clinicians and perhaps not everyone is familiar with the term co-creation. Could you explain to the audience what exactly that means in a practical level when developing digital healthcare? Yeah, we, we were actually um, doing uh, this kind of co-creation approach uh, in uh, several hospitals um, in, in Finland and in, in Europe as well. And uh, typically what it means is that um, we are working uh, closely together uh, with uh, clinicians and, and companies, uh, researchers, uh, also patients in order to, to make these solutions together. And the, the kind of approach that we created in one EU project in this was that uh, we first went to um, 
look at the, this kind of uh, practical challenges uh, that clinicians uh, saw in their practical uh, work life in the in the hospital and uh, then we prioritized what what of those are most important to take uh, forward and uh, then uh, for those most important um, ideas uh, we actually launched innovation competition where we were looking like best company to to build it up and uh, then uh, these this, uh, clinicians and, and companies uh, were uh, co-creating, uh, making prototype of the solution, giving feedback uh, about it, uh, making sure that it's exactly what is uh, wanted in this uh, particular context. And how can we help with the research here is, is uh, this approach that I was uh, showing here in my presentation. So we can look what is actually uh, existing out there we can uh, go to really uh, patients and understand what are the real needs of the patients and then bring them as requirements for their for the solutions. And we can also test uh, these solutions together with the, with the real patients and, and real clinicians to, to prove uh, their value for their taking forward into the real use in the in the in our healthcare systems. So that's that's what I mean by co-creation. Hmm. Thanks for explaining. So I see that we do have to move on. So thank you very much, Minna, for your presentation and good answers to the questions. I hope we will see you around campus a lot more when it's possible again. Yeah, when it's possible. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank okay. You. Wonderful. Take care. So moving on to our next program points, we actually have a little surprise that I didn't mention before, and that is that we are going to briefly have a presentation about the Henry Wallmann Prize. Uh, which will be explained to us by Bengt Arne Sjöqvist. Are you here with us, Bengt Arne? Yes, I am. Lovely. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this chance and time slot to present the Henry Wallman Prize. Now let's see if we can start sharing my screen. So, hopefully you should see something now. Yes, that looks good. Fine. Okay, now let's go. And uh, thank you, Mina, for pr the presentation. Uh, as a new colleague of mine, it's very interesting to hear you present what we are doing. <laughs> so that was very valuable. Thank you. Okay, about the uh, Henry Wallman Prize then. Uh, I'd like to give you first the background on the prize and something about who Henry Wallman was, and then also that it's time really to nominate for this year right now. Uh, so let's go. Uh, a little bit of background. This uh, Stiftelse in Medicino Technique, or Foundation for Biomedical Engineering, or short form SMT, was founded already in 1985 by, by Professor Torsten Olsson. And the aim was to increase the utilization of all the research results within biomedical engineering that appeared in the collaboration between Chalmers and Sagrenska. Because already at that time, there was a very strong collaboration between those two places. In fact, very intense. And uh, the financial basis for starting this uh, foundation was to use uh, some old funding that was in an old foundation by Professor Hammer Wallman. And that uh, foundation was called Stiftes and Rundgen Television, or Foundation for X-ray Television. And that foundation was funded in order to handle the funds that came from the exploitation of this X-ray television innovation. And at that time in 1985, there were two young PhDs hired to develop and run the business of this foundation. And it was me and my colleague Kai Lindekrantz, he's now a professor in Borås. And uh, what we did was, among other things, we contributed to spread and commercialize some products and solutions. And uh, some of these were, for instance, the MIDA coronet heart monitoring system, the e-health solution MobiMed, the FITO monitoring system STAN, and the EEG system called SACS. And in fact, all these are still living. Uh, the th first three are in companies and sold around the world and the sax is still the EEG system used in this region to handle uh, EEGs from for instance epilepsy 
And uh, this foundation is, is the Chalmers Foundation and its board of directors is appointed by Chalmers. So today the board consists of me as being the chairman. It's Andreas Hedström who will present after this presentation I saw. It's Mikael Elam who will appear later on in this program. And it's Professor Kai Lindekans at the University of Borås and Anders Karlström, our prefect at uh, electrical engineering. And this is just a slide showing two young and handsome men trying to get customers to all their ideas and bringing out good research results from Chalmers. Now, who was Henry Valma then? Well, you can say that he really was a pioneer in the medtech and biomedical engineering research and development area. And uh, his work started here at Chalmers already early in the 1950s fifties when he looked at this X-ray television possibilities. And you can also say that it laid the foundation for Chalmers and in many ways also Swedish research in this area, because these were among the first to really do something uh, related research in this area. And one of the important contributions from Henry Wallman was his philosophy and vision of close collaboration between technical and medical expertise in order to become successful in your research. And this is uh, like, like a, a very important part of what this prize is all about, because we want to promote this type of collaboration uh, with this prize. And you can say that this approach has very much characterized the activities and the people who have directly followed in the footsteps of Henry Wallman here at Chalmers. From uh, the now deceased Professor Torsten Olsson and his disciples to today's researcher and doctoral students. So this is Henry Wallman. He was born in 1915 and was uh, from America, United States. And uh, during World War II, he worked in a classified work group involving radar at MIT. He was in fact picked exactly for being in that group. And in 1948, he was uh, asked to become guest professor at Chalmers. And one of the ideas was that he should learn us here in Sweden about radar technology. And after that guest period, he decided to stay here. And in 1956, he became a Swedish citizen. And already in 1967, he was awarded a personal professorship in, in medical electronics. It might have been the first in Sweden. I'm not quite sure of that. And this is what it looked like doing research at that time. And uh, here up to the right corner, you can see the first demonstration of this X-ray television system. And uh, those that have looked closely on, on the blackboard behind can see that this is really probably the first demonstration of this in the world. And, uh, so, and that technology, of course, has become very, very important in, in healthcare because it saves us a lot of radiation when doing examinations. And here is one other figure showing the copy of what William Röntgen did when he demonstrated X-ray, but here Henry Wallman is doing it with the X-ray television, that is taking his own hand and having a ring on it so that you can see that on the screen. And here are the guys in the lab. Uh, now, so for going back to why do we have this price? During the late 90s and the 2000, SMT was part of starting up uh, the MedTech West organization. And after that, uh, MedTech West took over most of the original roles that SMT had. So it went like uh, down to a very low level of activity. But we were, that were part of the board decided that we need to do something about it because we still have some money and we still have a good network. So we discussed various ways how we could contribute to pr promote medtech and biomedical engineering innovation. So we decided in 2017 to establish an innovation award. And this award shall use the foundation capital to stimulate multidisciplinary collaborations within medtech and digital health in the spirit of Henry Wallman. Again, the strong thing about collaboration. 
So the status of the Hellman uh, uh, Prize is that we shall annually award an innovation prize in the spirit of Henry Wallman to a young researcher or a research group who, in close collaboration between expertise in technology and healthcare, successfully have transferred new knowledge within med tech biomedical engineering or digital health from academia yeah, to practical clinical use. And uh, these younger researchers may also include associate professor degree. And uh, the innovations may consist of a new or greatly improved product, a method or a process, and may have been developed within a new or existing company or otherwise reached clinical utilization. And that's also a very important uh, aspect of this prize because it's not just that you have made some good research. We really want to see that it has made clinical utilization. And that can, of course, be done in several ways. And uh, the price shall be based on activities anchored in Western Sweden and preferably at Chalmers and Sorgenska University Hospital or Sorgenska Academy. And this sort of limitation is due to the status of, of the foundation because we cannot change them as we like. So they, we need to have the price following our old status in one way or another. And the prize consists of a diploma and a scholarship. And those years we have uh, awarded uh, winners. The prize has been 50,000 Swedish kroners. And here are the winners so far. We have had uh, three times we have been given the prize. The first was given to Sabine Reinfeldt, which I also think will appear during this conference for the, her work within hearing aids. Uh, 2019, we had a group with Rika Bronemark, Kerstin Hogberg, and Max Ortiz Catalan for their work within bone anchor prosthesis. And last year it was Emma Anaheim and the cancer therapy work. So now it's time to nominate for this year's prize, and that's why I got this time slot to present this prize. We want you all to nominate people for this nomination for this prize. And, uh, you can send in nominations to by email to that email address you can see up here. And if you don't remember it, you can always go to Medtech West website and get all this information. Uh, we want the proposals to be available latest to May 16th, that is approximately a month from now. And we want, of course, the name and the proposal and a short CV and some kind of motivation or justification for this price. Maximum two A4 pages. And here you can also see a, a photo of uh, the diploma. And uh, there is a little cliffhanger here because if you look here on top, you see that there is a scoter here. And that scoter is of special importance for why the medical research, biomedical engineering research was started at Chalmers. But I will not tell you the full story now. So if you want to know the full story, you can either contact me or visit next prize ceremony. Then I will tell you. Thank you. A fantastic teaser. So thank you very much for that. Mm -hmm. So we have to move on in the schedule. So I'd like to hand over to Martin for the next program point. Thank you, Thanks. Cecilia. And uh, I'm very happy to uh, invite and welcome our next speakers. Uh, it's Sara Riggere, patient researcher at uh, Uppsala University. And it's Dr. Andreas Hellström, who is senior lecturer at the Department of Technology Management and Economics here at Chalmers. Uh, and the title of their presentation will be Patient Researchers and Patient Innovators, The Missing Link. And it will be extremely interesting to hear. I think there is a lot of connections to the presentation from Minna previously that we can discuss after this uh, presentation. So I really look forward to listening to both of you uh, and hereby I welcome you to take over the, the airtime, please. Thank you, thank you very much. I will share my screen uh, as we get started. Uh, there we go. Oh. So, thank you, and uh, <clears throat> thank you, Minna and the organizing committee for uh, doing this 
very, uh, it will hopefully be a very smooth transition to uh, our our topic, uh, where we will focus on uh, how to use our lived experience in research and innovation in health and in healthcare. Um, me and Sara have known each other for about uh, 10, 10 years and uh, shared a lot of thoughts and experience on how patients and patients' experience can play a more vital role in the development of <clears throat> of new systems in healthcare and in life science. Uh, Sara is, is uh, internationally well-known, uh, pioneer in the field of patient, uh, patient research and patient-driven innovation, and she will, uh, she will present her research in, in just a while. Um, I'm a researcher at the Department of Technology Management and Economics at Chalmers, and uh, I'm also one of the co-founders of the uh, Center for Healthcare Improvement, uh, a research and ed education center at um, TME. Um, for about 15 years, we have been collaborating with healthcare providers and uh, co-created knowledge on how to improve and uh, innovate. And we have uh, we have been we trained more than 600 uh, healthcare practitioners in our uh, our professional education program. I'm also, uh, I'm also very proud that we have uh, physicians and nurses from Sahlgrenska University Hospital and other uh, parts of the region taking a PhD in uh, technology management and economics. And it's fascinating to see what these people that becomes uh, bilingual, so to speak, uh, with both expertise in medicine and in management, what they, what they achieve and they've done some really successful uh, new uh, award-winning models on how to deliver care and so but for the last six or seven years or so uh, we have found ourselves uh, working more and more with patients and use their uh, experience as a basis for innovation in the healthcare system and how we can how we can integrate resources in the society in a more uh, user-centered way um, so after Sara's presentation. We will also present uh, uh, a Venova project that me and Sara is uh, co-leading to, uh, together, where we, where, where we call it uh, Patient Innovators, where we have gathered 15 persons with their uh, own experience of living with chronic diseases and, and also have experiences of trying to, trying to innovate uh, for themselves and or uh, others. So we, will we, we will present that uh, afterwards. Uh, after Sarah's presentation. You can take the next slide, Sarah. Yeah. Or you can go direct. Uh, so uh, the question here is how patient researchers and patient innovators might be the missing link in how to cr try to create a more uh, a better system in the, in the healthcare system or the life science system. So. Yes. Or is yours? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, and this is a topic I'm very passionate about and I have been working in for at least a decade in, in different contexts in different ways. And I will now take the opportunity to actually give a bit of a preview of my upcoming uh, PhD thesis with the title of Person Science in Parkinson's Disease, a Patient-Led Research Study. So this is work in progress, uh, and I am a doctoral student at, at the Radboud University in Nijmegen in the Netherlands, uh, where I am finalizing this work uh, pretty much as we speak. The, the studies are pretty much done. Uh, they are done, and they are now coming together nicely. So first, a bit of my personal background. I was born in 1971, and at that time, nobody ex suspected anything was, was amiss, that anything was, was that I had any health issues. I was a completely healthy baby and, and child. But in my early teens, I had my first symptoms of what would much, much later be, 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 be shown to be Parkinson's disease. Uh, but before I knew what it was, I, was, I, I eventually I had a diagnosis of, of a, a, a different condition, which turned out to be wrong. But Meanwhile, I, 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 became, I, I went to university and I became Master of Science at the Royal Institute of Technology, KTH in Stockholm. And then eventually, as I said, I did learn that I, had, I was diagnosed with Parkinson's disease in 2003. 
And then in 2010, I decided that I wanted to combine my patient experience with my engineering skills and try to improve things for myself and others with chronic diseases. So I decided to pursue a PhD. And I first went, I started at the Karolinska Institute and I recently now started calling myself a patient researcher. So this thesis of mine, why was it initiated? Well, for those of you who don't know much about Parkinson's disease, uh, I want to give a very brief introduction. Uh, this, this is a, a comic uh, cartoon that, was, that has been made by a, a, an artist with Parkinson's disease himself. This is a partial list of the symptoms that you can get if you have Parkinson's disease. Uh, luckily, uh, you don't get all of them at the same time, and not all of them happen to the same person. So it's, it's not as bad as all, that you get all of these, but it's a mix of, of all, all sorts of interesting problems. It's, a, it's, a, it's considered a very complex neurodegenerative disease with a wide variety of both motor symptoms that has to do with movement and non-motor symptoms that has to do with other parts, other functions of the body, as you can see in the image as well. And this, it takes an extremely individual combination of symptoms and treatment needs. This is a, a current uh, picture of, of my daily dose of medication with the, with the times of intake at the bottom there. This has changed a bit over the years, but it's, 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 this is my current regimen. And it's, it's pretty uh, essential that I get the, the timings right and the doses to not avoid, to, to avoid as, in, as much as I can side effects, but still get the benefit of, of the medication in terms of uh, wished, the, 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 the effects that I want from the medications so I can function as I'm, I'm used to. And as maybe you can imagine, the pharmaceutical treatments get increasingly complicated and difficult to manage optimally with progressing disease. I've now had Parkinson's for over 35 years, and I would be lying if I, if I wouldn't say that it, 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 is, it is a complicated regimen to follow and get right all days of the year uh, with all its uh, interesting side effects and other, other effects. And, uh, and there are no objective biomarkers to, to Parkinson's disease, which is a, a case in point here that a lot of the diseases to do with the, with the brain have no objectively measurable biomarkers. I sometimes say that I have diabetes envy because in diabetes type 1 you have a very clear biomarker for your current state in your blood glucose levels and, and as well as your long-term expected progression in terms of the HbA1c. But we have nothing like that in Parkinson's disease. Uh, and uh, on top of that, I don't see my, my, my doctor very often. I see my neurologist about once or twice a year, half an hour every time, which makes it one hour per year that I am in, in, in neurological specialty healthcare, symbolized by this red circle and this red dot in this picture. And it's important to remember, I don't want more hours in healthcare. I don't want to spend my time in healthcare. I want to spend my time in self-care with doing what I can and what I want to do. I don't want to be in healthcare. I want to, I want to spend it in, in doing things that I enjoy doing. Um, so it's important for me to find the right balance to get the help from healthcare that I need to, to, to complement the, 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 the things I can do myself and the knowledge I have acquired during my, all my years in, with this condition. So what was then the main gap in, in, in the, that, that this thesis addresses, attempts to address? So this goes a bit into what, what Minna was talking about, about self-care as well. And this is what self-care looks like according to clinicians, that patients follow prescribed treatment regimes, attend clinical visits and basically lead a, 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 a good life in, in terms of diet, stress and sleep and exercise. These things we all know they are good for us. Still, we don't do them, do we? But if you look at what self-care according to patients, the, we want to use self-care and, and health care as, as a means to live as, a good, as good a life as possible every single day. And of course, that's, that's a pretty much broader picture than the, the self-care according to clinicians. 
So this is the gap that my my uh, thesis uh, attempts to address. The, the, the differences and the, how we can incorporate and, and learn from the learned experience and the lived experience together. Uh, what really baffled me was when I realized that the absolute majority of research on self-care is conducted by people without lived experience of that particular condition that the, the research is addressing. And, and my thesis looks at a, a certain part of, of self-care, which is called personal science and it's a, it's a framework for self-monitoring and I will come back very shortly to what what I mean by personal science. So this is where I look I'm looking at the specific part of self-care in the in the lives of patients with Parkinson's disease starting from my own experiences of managing my Parkinson's disease over all these years. Uh, so some key concepts in, in this thesis first then personal science Personal science is a framework of study for single subject research. And in the thesis, I define it as a practice of exploring personally consequential questions by conducting self-directed end of one studies using a structured empirical approach. And this framework is, is complementary to clinical conventional clinical research. It's not, it's not intended to replace it. it it's, not, it's, it's different, but it's, it's complementary. And in personal science, the research and the personal studies are one and the same. And this can be used to answer questions like what works for me, where group studies, of course, answer questions like, is this particular treatment expected to work for an average patient? It doesn't answer questions like what works for, for a specific patients, in this case, me. So that's where personal science can help. And self-care in this thesis, I, I define as According to WHO, World Health Organization, the ability of individuals, families, and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. So, self tracking, and now I need to move these pictures again. I, <laughs> I have a window across the screen here. So, self tracking. It's a method for data collection that can be used in person science or in conventional group research. And it's defined as a process of deliberately collecting and structuring observations about one's own life. And then finally, patient-led research and patient researchers. Uh, patient, as Andrea said, per per persons with lived experience of disease, of disease, disability, or other health challenges can be called patient researchers or patient innovators. In this case, it's patient researchers because we are openly using we, our experiences in doing research. And that can be within academia or in other contexts. And that it can also be a family member or a person close to the person living with the disease. It doesn't have to be, you don't have to be a patient yourself. You can also work on basis only on your, on your experiences as a caregiver. So in this thesis, I, I, I aim to examine how patient-led research in the form of personal science can contribute to self-care in Parkinson's disease by uh, then exploring the feasibility of using personal science for self-care in Parkinson's disease, which I do with, with my, own two, my, my own studies of myself. And then in part two of the thesis, I investigate the transferability of the methods of personal science to more general per persons with Parkinson's disease, PWPs. And then in the part three, I examine patient-led research. And now I want to talk a bit, a bit about one of the studies I did on in part one, where I, I had a complex medication regimen, as you've seen before. And uh, as you see, also seen, I don't see my neurologist very often. So I, I, I wanted to find out, I wanted to learn how, how do these Medications effects vary over the course of, of a day for me personally. So I found an app that I could use to, to uh, do finger tapping as a, I used finger function as a proxy for medication effect. And, and found the, the graph in, 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 the, in the bottom there is there are the results from, from my, my experiment or my observations where I, the, the bottom two, two lines are my left hand two subsequent days. The middle two lines are my right hand, same two days, and the top lines are my husband, my control person, my husband. 
And as you can see, the, the, there is a difference between my right and my left hand, and, and it sort of goes up and down with the medication it takes, which are the, the bars, different color bars for different kind of medications. And when I did this, I, I did not know what I, was, what I would find. So I was a bit surprised at what I found with this, that I had a dip in function around lunch. And this is not something that I could easily have found in any other way, but to do these these observations myself because I was able to put my own context into the into, into the interpretation and I could use my knowledge and, and see and the data I, I, I collected with self-tracking to see how I could then understand my my condition better and how I could also improve my treatment which I did based on this I, 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 I tweaked my medication timing intakes and the result was a, a, a more even effect over the day. So a few conclusions. I'm an engineer, I like technology and I've tried a lot of technology over the years, but tracking takes time, effort and energy. <laughs> There's a very distinct burden of tracking when self-tracking is used, both in uh, obviously clinical group research but also in personal science, even though you do, you do it for your own sake, you, you, it's, it's hard, it takes a lot of time. At that time, you would probably more prefer to be, be used to doing something you enjoy rather than doing, collecting data over and over again. So that's important to take into account when you design and, and think about how, how, how to facilitate patients self-tracking. Sensors are, are all good and well for some, some, some uh, conditions. They work very well for objective measures. Like we all know weight, temperature, blood sugar, heart rate, blood pressure, where there are clear biomarkers for, for the phenomena you want to study. You can, of course, capture movements like that. That is the thing in Parkinson's disease with, with the problems moving. Capturing the movement is very easy with, with sensors and accelerometers in this case. But analyzing the movement, the result is really difficult. What is normal movement? What is optimal movement? How can you understand what people want to do and what, what would be the best way to do it? So it, it, this is a real challenge. There, there is some, some work on, in this field, but it's really, really difficult to, to understand the, 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 the data, what they mean. As an example, I can mention that I, I, have, a, a, I have two actually. I have, <laughs> I, I track myself in, 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 with these simple uh, activity trackers and even different trackers from even from the same uh, manufacturer, but more importantly from different manufacturers, interpret data slightly differently. So, so if, you, if you have two trackers from different, different commercial entities, they can show completely different numbers of steps, even though you've worn them on the, uh, during the same time because the, the algorithms interpret the data differently, slightly differently. So it's not easy to, to analyze and understand what movement tracking means in, 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 its, in its pure data form. So in, in conclusion, not everything that can be counted counts and not everything that counts can be counted. A new favorite quote of mine from 63 when I was even, wasn't even born. And a few important things to consider in this is who's asking the questions, the questions that the data is expected to answer. I've come across far too many solutions looking for a problem in my time, in, especially in Parkinson's disease, where uh, uh, some entrepreneur or tech, tech, tech guy, or most often a guy, have, think they have come up with a, a radically new idea to, to, to analyze movement. And then they think, okay, so which diseases have problems with movement? And they think Parkinson's. So they, can, they come with a solution looking for a problem to solve when, when, when it should be the other way around, as, as both me and Andreas has highlighted. So my tracking experiences are, can be summed up by this. I track specific aspects for limited periods of time. And I, when I track, I track medications and function in context. Uh, context is important to understand and interpret the data. Like maybe I missed, uh, maybe I was really stressed or maybe I had a bad night of sleep. Then I know that my medication will work less well than, I, than I'm used to. And one important aspect as well is that 
sharing methods is more important, often more important in person size than sharing data. Because my data is very personal to me, but probably not the of interest of, to many other people because of the data is such, but the methods of how I, how I find what works for me is probably a very much more importance of interest for others as well. <clears throat> so in short, this is, I think this in a way also describes what Mimino was talking about in the way that patients sometimes take, take other routes than healthcare intends. And I think this is rather than them forcing patients to take the healthcare route, we should, we should embrace this and learn from, learn together, co-create as both Andreas and Mina have talked about, co-create solutions based on the, 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 the problem to solve, the, 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 the users, the end users problem that needs solving. And my, I have a, a few thoughts on why I think this, this is so difficult, so hard to do because much of the systems we have in healthcare and biomedicine are based on the logic that the knowledge comes from a book, a book that not everybody has access to and that not everybody can, can, can understand and, and take, take, make use of the knowledge in. But we, do, we now have a system where, where the knowledge and the information is pretty much available to everybody around the world. And this makes, makes it possible to work in different ways, more networking ways and more collaborative ways. But still the systems we have in place and regulatory systems and, and financial systems and ways of working are, are often more based on the logic of the book than on the logic of the internet. And this of course leads to problems because if we look at the traditional evidence-based medicine model, we have clinical expertise, best research evidence and patient values and preferences to be taken together. But what happens when patients when, the, when this logic is built on the book, but patients can then access the best research evidence and read the papers that ourselves. And that when patients can work in network ways that healthcare they haven't still adapted. And also as an example, how I, I manage my medications on my own. Then we need to update this model and talk about that we have clinical expertise needs to be also, we need to talk about that, that aspect is also not free from values and experiences and preferences. Uh, so we also need to, to acknowledge that there is no such thing as a completely unbiased clinical expertise. We all have values and preferences with, with us in everything we do. And that patients, the patient's part also should be complemented by true expertise, not only in what we know ourselves, but also that, that we can know about research in general in, 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 in certain topics. So in brief, Patient researchers can bridge different perspectives and, and bring the lived and the learned experience together for the better of, of the system and, and also all. Thank you. Thank you. Then we can uh, move over to Andrea's part. Yeah, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> we will uh, just uh, shortly present uh, uh, ongoing uh, ongoing project funded by uh, by Vinova that we called uh, Patient uh, Innovators. Uh, it's uh, it's ongoing and it was a bit a little bit delayed due to the uh, COVID nineteen situation, of course. Um, can you take the next slide, please? Sorry. Um, here we take the <clears throat> um, the focus on the lived experience. As, as the basis for innovation. And we believe that this might be an underutilized uh, source of, in, uh, of knowledge. So um, lived experience of long-term diseases uh, that offers a somewhat different, different perspective as, as Sara has uh, highlighted so, uh, so clearly. Uh, often we see it as um, um, the life event perspective as we, as we call it how it's perceived by the patients. And this offers often a more uh, holistic view where uh, healthcare might be only be one, one part and uh, the focus is, might be more shift towards uh, health uh, or, or life, uh, life uh, itself. Um, it might also uh, focus more on, on other, uh, other um, public organizations and so on might be 
that the focus expands from being a, um, a healthcare issue to a, a welfare issue. So um, when we, in this project, we have focused more on um, uh, social innovations and innovations in uh, uh, everyday life. We have uh, deliberately not focused on more, um, uh, more specific technical innovations we, we, because we believe that there might be another innovation process behind that. So uh, we focus more on uh, in innovations in everyday life and social innovation. We have uh, a 100% uh, focus on the patient's view. First, we focus on the patient and or relative's uh, experience, and then we, we, we focus on, on the healthcare and other web welfare organizations' uh, view. This is, um, in, this is partly in, inspired by uh, the research from Eric von, Eric von Hippel at uh, MIT, who uh, coined the term lead, lead user in innovation management, um, basically the idea that the end user of the product or the service might also be the best, uh, best innovator. So um, patients living with uh, long-term chronic disease might be the best innovator of some uh, of these, these social uh, in innovations or innovations in everyday life. So we, um, in this Vinova project, we have uh, gathered or, and, and uh, selected uh, 15 different patient innovators. It was a huge interest and many people uh, applied, but we have uh, 15 people uh, participating um, from um, various parts of the, of the country, but we are uh, happy and satisfied that we have a majority uh, that comes from the region of uh, Sjötland. <clears throat> and we also have a broad spectra of uh, various uh, various diseases um, people with uh, inflammatory bowel disease uh, parkinson cancer rheuma uh, diabetes and so on and also also some um, some rel relatives um, and we focus on on the shared uh, experiences of trying to and and and, and they have also uh, experiences of trying to innovate for themselves or or uh, or for other uh, for others. You can take the next slide, sorry. So what we are uh, doing, we are uh, co-creating. Co uh, comes the term again. We are co-creating knowledge together with uh, these uh, these particip participants. We have a workshop uh, series uh, where we share experience, uh, experiences and, and elaborate on and adjust innovation techniques in, in partnership with these patient innovators. And uh, so they are giving feedback and uh, their experiences on this. And, and we have the ambition of, the, of being very, very practical uh, to try to develop strategies uh, and concrete tools and techniques on how patients can be can be better uh, innovators. So we are uh, we are um, we have the ambition to create a handbook for patient-led uh, innovation. We have a very early draft of it this, uh, so far. The overall goal with this project is, of course, to expand the view of, of uh, what innovation might be in, in uh, welfare and uh, life science, and also to highlight the, um, the end user's uh, contribution. <clears throat> and the increased uh, ability to innovate in health and welfare. So uh, I want to in, in, uh, inspire and support potential uh, patient innovators, but also working together with uh, healthcare and uh, other uh, public, public organizations on how they can develop strategies on how to um, collaborate with patient innovators and also how they can be better at absorbing innovations outside their own uh, organizations. So um, the co-creation team, uh, of course, we have our, our uh, uh, 15 patient innovators. Uh, we also have two non-for-profit uh, associations, um, patient-led patient, uh, non-profit non organizations with us, Forum Spetspatient and uh, Ankraftens Hus. Um, 
And uh, from the healthcare part, we have a collaboration with the uh, regional uh, region of Sutherland. And um, if anyone is interested in participating, please uh, please contact me or, uh, or or Sara afterwards. And it's uh, we are leading this together, me and and Sara. And if you want to uh, read more about it, here is a here's the website where you can find more uh, information about the project. And now we have the future perspectives, right? Yeah. Uh, so, as we said, we have uh, we have the. Let's see if it wants to. No, that's what I will do. The upcoming books, uh, my PhD thesis, and the report, a guide to patient-driven innovation that Andreas just mentioned in the in the work with patient innovators. And that will be only in Swedish, uh, but uh, my PhD thesis will, of course, be in English for everyone who's interested in reading it that doesn't uh, can't read, it, read Swedish. And we have another thing, uh, future perspective in the in this right address. Yes, as <clears throat> as Mina Mina also mentioned, we have uh, we're uh, happy to have uh, support funding from the area of advanced health engineering uh, <clears throat> with. Um, Project that we call our program that we call the Nervorden uh, Flitter Hem when when healthcare moves home. Uh, we have a, try to establish a systems innovation view of that, uh, initiated by researchers from uh, organization and innovation, um, healthcare architecture, and uh, medtech uh, and di digital um, health. And this is co created uh, together with clinical experts and other relevant uh, stakeholders, of course. And here, here is also the patient's perspective and the concrete involvement of patients and relatives will be a core pillar in this, in this, in this future work, of course. So, uh, and Sara is also part of part of this uh, part of this program. So. Yes, and finally, our if we, if you want to contact us in any way, the easiest might be use Twitter actually. Uh, yes, that's that concludes our presentation. Thank you very much, Sara and Andreas. I think you put forward a very nice perspective, an important perspective of of uh, patient-centered and also patient-led research and innovation that can uh, really change how we can treat patients and and people with disabilities for the future. Um, I have a lot of questions on my own, uh, but I would also like to remind everyone in the audience that we have the possibilities to post questions on the YouTube chat via the email address and using the text message number that you see uh, on the screen. Uh, so hopefully uh, they will drop in some questions also from people viewing this, but I will start from, from my side. So um, the first question is to Sara. You said that uh, you had your first symptoms at the age of 13, if I count correctly. Uh, and then it took until the age of 32 before yeah. you had your diagnosis. Do you think, and in that case, in what way uh, that patient-led research would have sort of made that diagnosis go faster? Or, or what, what took so long and would a more patient-centered research have made that possible sooner to get the diagnosis? That's a very interesting question. And strangely, uh, strangely as it may sound, I'm actually happy that I wasn't diagnosed sooner. Because, and that's, that's uh, actually due to the cultural view, the social view, uh, the, the actually, the disease view of, of, of Parkinson's disease. The illness view is what you what you experience from the inside, but the disease is the social and and, and, the, and scientific understanding of the same of the same condition. And had I been diagnosed with Parkinson's disease, a disease that so very clearly is is associated with the elderly, in my teens or even in my early twenties, I, I I actually think I wouldn't have. There's a lot of things I wouldn't have done. Mm. I think I would have been held back by it. Uh, and because even to this day, patients who are diagnosed with Parkinson's disease get, get to hear sometimes that 
you have Parkinson's disease in five years, you'll be in a wheelchair. And if, if you as a patient hear that from someone who's, who's, who's the expert that you go to for, for help, that very easily becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So it, it's a great question, but not easy to, to answer. But I definitely think that more patient-led research will increase the, uh, the, the understanding, the genuine understanding of diseases, because it is, it's, it's, it, there's an increasingly, uh, increasingly large uh, evidence base that what, what clinicians and researchers think that patients think is, in, is the most important is not the same as what patients think when you ask them directly. So there are, there are important aspects of, of living with diseases that are lost in, 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 in the interpretation from what traditions think, the patients think, to what they actually think. So in that sense, I, actually, I definitely think that patient, more patient-led research will, will, will improve understanding and, 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 and speed up research, research results, research implementation even. Mm. No, I think, but it, it, it's a challenge to, and also it's a challenge then to know when is the appropriate time to diagnose someone with Parkinson's. Mm -hmm. I, I can see that yeah. challenge um, yeah. very much. Uh, you also highlight the importance of uh, what works for me. And mm -hmm. I, I can see that this, is, this must be really crucial then uh, for really individualized treatment. But how do we generalize? I mean, you had that as a part of your uh, PhD thesis too. So you can, you can very much go into details and do detailed studies on a, on a specific person. But how do we learn from that uh, and generalize to a larger uh, group of people with the same illness? Then? Yes, and this is where there are, of course, limitations to what personal science can achieve or is, is, is suited for as well. And one thing it's, it's probably not suited for is, is research intending to look at group, group, group conditions, group uh, specifics. So in, in personal science, I th as I said, I think that the methods, the, the evaluation methods, the data collection methods and the uh, reasoning methods are, are very much likely to be uh, generalizable to others with similar or other conditions even. Whereas the interventions and the and this results on, on sort of what, what, what works, what, what will work for others, they, is probably not generalizable as, as much as, as the methods. Mm. So I think that's one of the limits of personal science. I think we need to use the methods that are appropriate for the, 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 the question we're trying to answer. I think that's one where personal science probably is not the best. All right, yeah, I, I see what you mean. Um, I also have a question to uh, Sara, actually, or to Andreas. I think Sara and, and actually both of you um, emphasize in different situations that we have this of too much solutions coming looking for a problem. And I, I, I can definitely see that also from my own research sometimes. But don't we need both? Uh, so, so maybe you can elaborate a little bit more on the importance of of sort of how having a problem-based or a patient-led sort of innovation and research, and also the other part of, of having uh, maybe new tools developed, which we don't know yet what they're for, but they can be extremely important for the future. Andreas, what do you say? Yeah, of course, this is this is not this is definitely not the either or question. It, it's it's uh, complicated issues that might that, that benefits from many different perspectives. Um, to give one example, I just recently read a wonderful article from uh, Salgensk, uh, their, their, uh, their newspaper, uh, with three, uh, three physicians where, uh, with their experience of, uh, of being treated uh, for uh, Corona. Um, just, just their experience of coming to work horizontally instead of vertically. Mm. how they experience the whole healthcare system very, very differently and, and how we can, how we can uh, use that, that perspective also. It's not I, either or. They were, it, it was a wonderful article what they, what they saw uh, within the system also. So, so, um, and this is also something that we want to, 
of course, expand more in, in this uh, when healthcare moves home, where we're talking about systems innovation, where we need all relevant stakeholders perspective around the table mm. simultaneously. I would have loved to discuss this uh, new initiative more. I think it's really exciting. The problem is that the time is fighting against us. And I would like mm. to bring up a question also from the audience before we move to the next active break that is coming. So s there is a question also to Sara. Uh, I will read it as it appeared. So you must use uh, many different drugs, uh, I assume from different pharma companies. Are they interested in your results? from tweaking your daily drug intake and how they can sort of spread that or generalize that to other patients? Very insightful and relevant question. And yes, I do use four, depending on how I count, five different drugs from my, from my Parkinson's from four different uh, pharma companies. Uh, and pharma companies are interested in what I do. Uh, to understand how they better can meet patients needs uh, for for self-care activities but i doubt that any one company would be interested in looking at the combination that i take both because the combinations are very very individual there wouldn't be a clear uh, sort of um, evaluation path in there but also because who would be responsible for which side effects? The regulations here work against these questions again. So, and I've actually been looking actively for a long, long time to find clinicians and researchers wanting to work with me on, on how to uh, help people with Parkinson's optimize their own treatment. Uh, but I couldn't find them, so I, I, I had to start doing it myself uh, to help others as well. And that's what I'm doing now trying to, to, to build uh, towards that. Um, but excellent question, and the short answer is no. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I, think, I think it's an impressive uh, approach to take that if, if no one else wants to do it, uh, let's do it myself. But uh, <laughs> thank you very much, both uh, Sara and you. Andreas. I really appreciate uh, that you took the time to come here to us. Now it's time to uh, get moving a little bit before we actually listen to our third and final speaker for this afternoon block before coffee. So Cecilia. Yes. So um, before we let you go away on a little uh, break, I just wanted to lead you in a little bit of stretching and it's not going to take very long. I teach my ergonomics students this, so this is kind of a classic sequence for me. So the first thing I'd like you to do is um, put your fingers together like that and push them forward as far as you can. Let your shoulders get a good stretch there. Without breaking anything in closed ways. Uh, exactly. Uh, I think we're both in that challenge situation right now. Then place your fo folded hands on top of your head and let each elbow point up toward the ceiling. This should give you a nice stretch between your ribs. So let your rib cage become a cheese doodle for a little while. Come back up to the middle. And then the other side. You could also look up at the ceiling if you want to kind of keep the form. Too many instructions. <laughs> I'm good at keeping on talking, you know. And that's a good stretch for the ribs, so come back to the middle. Now we're going to form a U shape with our arms, or a very boxy one. So imagine an American goalpost, basically, for American football. Try to get your arms behind your head if you can. Just kind of pinch your shoulder blades together. So that should give it a little nice warmth in the middle of your back. And then when you're done with this, you can tilt 180 degrees so that your arms are pointing downwards. This should really try out your, uh, <laughs> your suit jacket there. And then when you're satisfied it's with this... not only that. Yeah. <laughs> and when you're satisfied with this, push backward as if you were doing an upside down uh, push up. And keep your hands there for a bit and let go and shake out. Okay, I hope that did some good for your upper back. And uh, now we will take a little break. And uh, shall we extend it a bit or do we come back at 2.30? I think we'll uh, come back at 2.30 because I think there yeah. could be questions um, that we would like to round off with. So okay. Only one minute. That's good. Okay, so go take a little leg stretcher. We'll be back very shortly. Okay, everyone, welcome back. So that was a, 
uh, rather modest little break, and it is time for us to move on to the next speaker. Uh, and before I present him, I would just like to remind everyone that please do feel free to use the chat and the email and the SMS number for questions, as it makes it a little bit more lively. So without further ado, Matthias Vade, Professor of Applied Artificial Intelligence at uh, the Department of Mechanics and Marine, uh, Maritime Sciences at Chalmers. Welcome. Thank you very much. So I will share my screen here. Um, just a second. Go. Um, so you're going to talk about Isolde, a humanoid robot for social distancing in healthcare applications. So that yes. sounds like yes. an interesting flip from what we've heard previously today. Yeah, there we go. Can you see the screen well? Yes, we can. All right. Thank you very much for the introduction and thank you for inviting me to speak here today. I'm very happy to be participating. Um, and uh, today I will present uh, a little bit on our robot uh, called Isolde. It's a prototype uh, mobile robot that we have uh, developed. And as you can see there, it's intended to help with social distancing, but it also has other um, applications as you will see uh, in a while. Uh, but first, a little bit of background, probably all of you know this, but obviously the, the fraction of, for example, elderly people is growing very fast um, in some countries at least. So what was once a population pyramid is no longer a pyramid and will be even less so by, say, uh, in, in the near future. Um, and of course, that puts a lot of strain on healthcare, uh, both in terms of costs, obviously, but, but also in terms of uh, staff shortages and, and um, similar issues. So, um, one can alleviate some of those problems, not all obviously, but some of them with, with technology, of course. And um, just to give you some examples of uh, technologies, and here I will focus on specifically on interactive technologies. So technologies that at least could have an interactive component in them where the user uh, or, or the patient, if it's in a hospital, um, would um, interact uh, with the system. So one example is, is a smart home where of course, um, you envision a home as, um, equipped with various sensors that can, for example, notice if a person falls and doesn't get up, or let's say if a person with dementia leaves uh, his or her home, etc. cetera. Um, another possibility is to use mobile robots. Um, on the right there, you see two Japanese robots, uh, one that's obviously hel helping to lift the patient uh, for some reason. And uh, in the lower right is a, is a robot helping out in, in a storage room. And on the left, you actually see our prototype. It may not be as elegant, but um, this is our Isolde robot. Uh, as you can see, it has a mobile base and a, a, at least reasonably uh, humanoid upper body with a large bulbous head that houses a laptop where its interactive capabilities are uh, located, so to speak. Uh, and I will show you a lot more about Isolde in, in a while. But um, another type of technology that can be important in this aspect are so-called conversational agents, um, basically computer programs that you can talk with. And um, two, uh, some of them have this type of embodiment, meaning that they are uh, visualized as, as an animated character on screen. That's not always the case, but in some cases, uh, um, such an approach is used. So um, in our case, actually on the robot, um, we have a conversational agent that handles the uh, interaction between the robot um, and its users, as you will see um, in a while. So these are some main types of technologies and how can it then be used? Uh, there are of course plenty of uses, but just to give you a few examples, again, focusing on, on interaction between, between um, um, the system and its user. Uh, for example, you could have a, an agent that gives medicine reminders, making sure that uh, people take uh, the correct medication at, at the correct time. Uh, lifestyle coach, uh, coaching is another example where um, the system might help um, to, uh, well, for example, quit smoking if a person is a smoker or uh, keep training if the person is uh, uh, trying to keep healthy, etc. Um, and then um, there is also the possibility of sending and receiving messages, uh, video and uh, email messages, which of course uh, many of us can, can do without the help of, uh, for example, an, an agent. But um, for example, for an elderly person, it might uh, in certain cases be, be useful to have such a tool. Then I have activation by which I mean a stimulating discussion that uh, of course ideally should be with a person, but since uh, there isn't uh, enough staff perhaps available to talk with everybody at all the time, all the time. Uh, one could imagine using a so-called conversational agent and that to have stimulating discussions, for example, with uh, uh, patients with dementia. 
And then there are other tasks such as uh, doing deliveries uh, or transportation internally in hospitals and also perhaps handling some me basic medical tasks. And these two latter applications I will show you later in connection with the demonstration of the robot. Uh, but before I, I show the robot, uh, I actually want to spend some time putting our work in, into context because we are working uh, on conversational agents in general. Um, and uh, Isolde is one application. It's a very important one, but uh, it's not the only one. Um, so I want to give you a little bit of background on conversational agents. And in particular, I want to highlight uh, one aspect, namely interpretability that we are very much uh, focused on. Um, so what's a conversational agent? Well, I said it, I think before, it's a computer program that you can interact with naturally with, with uh, speech, for example. Um, and many of these agents follow what was known as a pipeline model, where you have um, a so-called dialogue manager that is the um, system that handles the actual dialogue between uh, the agent and the user. So this system would take input from the user, for example, well, a statement or a question. Then it would uh, figure out what the user said or rather what he or she meant. So intent detection. Then there is the cognitive processing um, where which you can call thinking, if you like, where the agent figures out what to say. And then there's the output processing where the agent actually formulates the output. Then there are also various uh, other modalities that are a bit peripheral, such as automated speech recognition and speech synthesis that of course are important, but not really a core part of, of an agent. Uh, and most agents also have a knowledge base, uh, which is basically the, all the facts known to the agent. And if you look at, contemporary ongoing research, probably 95% or more of it involves um, so-called uh, deep neural networks, so a type of black box models um, that make use of statistical language models. So without going into details, I will not explain this in, in detail, but um, here you have one example, a so-called encoder-decoder network that uh, takes in a sentence, a question, uh, word by word in, into a recurrent neural network, which puts this network in a particular state. And then uh, using also the knowledge base, it would produce with the help of a statistical language model uh, response. Um, so this is the, this, this type of approach is not necessarily an encoder decoder network, but this type of approach is by far the most uh, common in the current research. And deep neural networks have many really good uses, uh, as you know, probably they are excellent at image processing and uh, speech uh, processing and things of that sort. However, um, I'm uh, personally a bit concerned about their use in, um, well, in decision making in general, and particularly then conversational agents, which is uh, uh, my main field. Um, um, and that's so because uh, these type of systems have a black box nature, uh, as I just said, which means that they are very difficult to analyze and to predict what type of output uh, they would give. Um, so what can sometimes happen is that they suffer a catastrophic failure, which is more or less inexplicable. So here you have a famous, a rather famous example with um, a deep network saying confidently that this is a cat. Well, I'm not a zoologist, but as far as I can see, this is not a cat. Um, and uh, well, the, the main point here is not the fact that it makes a mistake, but the fact that it's very difficult to disentangle or to understand what was the cause of this mistake and how do you fix it um, with a black box model. There is also the problem that such models require huge amounts of high quality dialogue data. If we're talking about conversational agents, you need dialogue data uh, because all of these approaches are data driven. So they require huge amounts um, of data. And um, well, getting a lot of dialogue data is easy, but getting high quality dialogue data is not so easy. Um, so that's um, another problem for, for this type of model. Then there are some more technical things, for example, that the, the, the way they process information with the statistical language model can get entang entangled with the knowledge base so that you really can't separate them. But, um, that's perhaps a bit of a minor point. But from my point of view, um, I'm hoping to see a shift uh, when we're talking about conversational agents, which would be more to more towards systems that are inherently explicable, as I will come to uh, in a moment. And indeed, um, the trends um, are going a little bit in that direction, because there is at least proposed legislation that would favor more interpretable systems. There is the Algorithmic Accountability Act in the US, and then there is um, another uh, 
proposed legislation called the right to an explanation in, in the EU. Um, and of course, accountability is closely related to interpretability, right? Because if you, if you want to have a system that's accountable, you have to be able to understand, uh, at least if you want to, uh, to fix any problems that, or any errors that it makes, you have to be able to understand what was the cause uh, of the error. And as I think I mentioned briefly before, this is particularly important in the type of high stakes decision making that we have in some of these systems. So, um, for example, in our case, we have a conversational agent that is attached to a robot that is at least ultimately intended to work in hospital, where, of course, the margin for catastrophic error is, is very small. So um, we want to make sure and be certain that we understand precisely how this system works. Um, and just as a side note, um, it's interesting to note that while 95% of the research in this topic at the moment is focusing on black box models, uh, what happens if you ask the users, so for example, organizations, um, governments, uh, companies, etc., what are their uh, preferences related to AI? Um, and it turns out that, um, as was uh, uh, covered in a recent um, review paper, I, I didn't put the link here, but I can, I can uh, provide it to you if you're interested, uh, that um, these entities, their top priority, which about 70 to 80% of them mention, is transparency in relation to AI. So the exact opposite of black boxes. So that's important to keep in mind. All right, so what are we doing about this? Uh, now I get to, to our research a little bit before I will actually present the robot. So hang in there, it's, it's coming soon. So what we are doing is that we are developing a um, um, dialogue manager called DAISY, which is uh, where we have interpretability uh, in mind all the time. So it's um, every part of a DAISY agent is fully interpretable, so one can easily understand um, every piece of the agent, precisely what it does. That doesn't mean that it's always a simple system. Um, they, they can be very complex, but you can understand the individual parts. And more importantly, if something is wrong, you can uh, correct it. And as I um, probably said before, that uh, DAISY is indeed the technology or the type of dialogue manager that we use in Isolde. Um, and of course, in this brief presentation, there's no way I can explain uh, DAISY in detail, and you probably wouldn't want to hear that uh, either. But um, before I show the robot, I just want to give you um, some underlying design principles that we apply when we are developing DAISY. So it's more of a manifesto than a presentation of a research method, really. But so here they are. First, uh, as I already said, is interpretability. So from a developer's point of view, we want to make sure that uh, a DAISY agent is, is fully interpretable. You can understand what it does and how it does it. Moreover, we want to make sure that the data um, is independent from um, the procedural memory, so the uh, dialogue capabilities of the agent. So we can, in, in principle, just remove the data and replace it by new data if we want to apply essentially the same agent in a different setting. Then, related to interpretability, we also have the inherent capability to explain. So this takes it one step further. So interpretability means that uh, a user would be able, or a developer would be able to understand what the agent does and how it does it. Inherent capability to explain rather, um, means that a you, uh, any user, whether it's a, a professional developer, just uh, someone who has never used the system at all before, um, should be able to get an explanation from the agent. So if the agent does whatever it does, then the user can say, how did you make this conclusion? How did you come to this uh, result? And then the agent should be able to explain that in non-technical language. So this is what we are building into to DAISY. Moreover, um, we are also adding interactive learning, meaning that it should also be possible for a non-expert using non-technical normal language to teach uh, a DAISY agent new capabilities. And finally, we have inquisitiveness, which means that uh, the agent uh, should be able to uh, try to extend its capabilities so that if you teach it something, it will try to generalize. But um, before making use of a generalized concept, it would ask the user, is this actually correct, etc. All right. So now, finally, I'm going to um, say a, a little bit more uh, about the actual robot. So here you have it. Uh, as you can see, it's a prototype. Um, it's um, not, one would say, 100% finished. It's not a finished product, but it's certainly fully functional. 
Um, and it's intended for use in hospitals and, and other care facilities ultimately. But here you see it pictured in our lab, which is where it's uh, residing at the moment. As for the hardware or the physical manifestation, as you can see, it's a wheel-based robot. Uh, it has a somewhat humanoid upper body. We haven't added arms yet. Um, and it also has um, an animated face then on the screen. And the laptop, which constitutes or which, uh, to which the screen is attached, um, has a conversational agent based on DAISY in it. Yeah. All right, so what is this robot capable of? Well, uh, the current capabilities, um, so this is still in development, so we are definitely not done, but the current capabilities is that the robot is capable of a basic type of interaction with uh, various people, doctors and patients, for example. Um, it can deliver objects that are placed on a tray. The tray is not in this picture, but we had it in the previous slide. You see there are small cup uh, on, on the tray. So it can deliver objects and it also can uh, measure the temperature of the patient to determine whether he or she has uh, fever. Um, so here you see an example where uh, perhaps a doctor is uh, getting ready to send a robot uh, on, a, on a task uh, to visit a patient and the robot then asks if it should take the patient's temperature. Uh, we are adding more features. So one of those is taking messages. Of course, ideally with a conversational agent, you would hope that if you talk to it, you can, you can uh, well, state whatever you want to convey, and then the agent would convey it to, to the doctor. But uh, realistically speaking, the agent may not be able to handle all forms of dialogue. So therefore, we want to add a feature where we can actually record a message, either audio or video, and then just play it back to, to, a, to a doctor or a nurse. And perhaps uh, if we add arms to it, the uh, robot, they, it will be able to, to also lift objects and uh, move them about. And as I said in the beginning, one of our motivating factors when we started with this, which was over a year ago, was the social distancing. When we started, we were thinking, okay, by the time we're done, the pandemic will be long gone. But uh, well, that turned out to be wrong. Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, it's still ongoing. Um, so um, the possibility of social distancing here, whereby the robot would do the final, or perhaps only the final meters of transportation is, is still relevant. Obviously, uh, um, that does not entirely eliminate risk, but it can help uh, reduce it a little bit. Okay. So here's the structure, perhaps not that important. Um, the software structure, we have a DAISY on the left there. It takes in speech uh, commands, and then it can give speech as output and also the facial animation. It can display images if relevant. It can show a map. Uh, we also have the high level robot application on the right that communicates with a low level uh, um, code on the robot, which uh, is written in ROS, so the robot operating system. So that part has its movement and localization, obstacle avoidance. And then it's also connected to, to an infrared camera um, for taking the temperature measurements. All right, so um, I want to demonstrate the robot. Uh, and first I want to say a bit about the video before uh, I show it. So uh, this will be a standard use case where a doctor instructs uh, Isolde to deliver an object, uh, in this case a cup uh, containing perhaps medicine to a patient, um, and then to take the patient's temperature. Um, and the robot then does this and returns to the doctor and uh, gives uh, information. Uh, so this is a, a video that we shot in, in our lab, so there are no real doctors here. Well, a PhD at least, uh, but not an actual uh, medical doctor. Um, and uh, the, there is some music in the video, and that's because the robot makes a bit of noise when it moves, so we're trying to hide that, but um, that is a minor issue that, that can be fixed. And before I show the video also, which is about two minutes long, uh, one final thing I want to also of course, acknowledge my team here. So it's uh, Marco, Christer, and Mauro who have really done an incredible job um, in working with this robot. Okay, so now I will try to show you the video. Uh, if I can stop sharing, I'm gonna see if I can find the video and then I will share that. Uh, Matthias, uh, yep. this is the technician here in Runan. Uh, there is a little tick box now when you're going to share the next clip. Yep. And that you can click in up, uh, that says optimize for video clip. Yep. And that will run I'm the video smoothly. They are both clicked, so I will run it. Um, there we go. So I hope that you can see the screen. Yes, I think you can. Um, so I will run the video. Unfortunately, the sound is not very good in this video. I'm going to put my sound, that's the property of the video. Um, I'm going to put it up to maximum. I suggest you increase your volumes on your computer so you can hear it well. So here we go. Hey, 
Azor there. Go room one. Of course. Should I take the temperature also? Yes, please. Okay, I will measure the temperature. Okay, so that's the video. I'm going to go back to my um, presentation. Uh, let's see where you have it. There. Okay, so there you have a demonstration of what the robot uh, does uh, at the moment, or at least one thing that it can do. It can do a little bit more than that, but this is um, an example. As you can see, it wasn't an extremely interactive e example. It takes a while for, for the robot to make the um, infrared measurement in order to, to make sure that we get it uh, reasonably accurate. Um, so to summarize, we are, we are developing this robot. Uh, as you could see, it's very much in the prototype stage. Um, and one of its functions is to provide social distancing, but it also has other capabilities. And we are using this interpretable dialogue manager, DAISY, um, for the conversational parts of, of this system. And as I mentioned, we are, of course, very interested in, in collaboration. We would like to test this outside uh, of the laboratory environment uh, uh, as soon as that's uh, possible. All right. Um, thank you very much for listening. I think I will stop there. <laughs> thank you very much, Matthias. It was uh, it was very interesting and uh, enjoyable to see Isolde in action. Um, I have some questions for you. Some of them are not specifically about Isolde, but more about the general idea of conversational agents and how to train them. I'm yep. curious to know, you mentioned uh, that in order to train them properly, you need a lot of high quality dialogue data. What is high quality dialogue? Right. Um, th that's the bit of a problem, right? Because um, that approach or using a lot of data applies specifically to the black box models. It's those models that need a lot of data. We do this in a different way. So uh, our model is not primarily data driven. It's more an interactive learning where we teach the agent its uh, capabilities. At least that's that's the intention. But uh, for those data driven models, well, that's a very good question. And um, a common problem in this uh, respect is that when you have a system that learns from data, you must curate the data very carefully, right? Because there can be inherent biases in the data um, that uh, the uh, system will otherwise learn. So it's a very hard question how to get high quality data. I know that um, in those approaches where they use this type of black box models uh, with large data sets, what they typically do is that they um, source, for example, using this mechanical Turk, for example, they have a lot of people generating dialogue on the topic um, that they want the agent to, uh, to learn. But of course, making a quality assessment of that is very hard. You have to go through uh, all the data very carefully to do that. Um, so that's indeed one reason why we are not using that approach. Hmm. And attaching that to your DAISY design principles, uh, I thought when I was listening to you going through the different principles, is this how you wish most humans would actually learn to communicate? Uh, oh, that's a good question. Um, well, of course, the interpretability is, is, uh, is important in all aspects, not just when you're talking to conversational agents, but also to humans, of course. Uh, 
And indeed, I mentioned this um, proposed legislation like the Accountability Act and the right to an explanation. And that uh, those suggestions have been uh, criticized in the sense that why should you only ask for interpretability from uh, automated systems? You should maybe ask them for the same from, from humans as well. So, so that's a good point. But uh, otherwise, uh, yeah, I don't think I have a very good answer apart from that. I suppose in your line of work, it's easy to slip into philosophy and robot human ethics a lot. I yeah, that's that, that, so. that, that can happen. <laughs> I do have one thing that I'm wondering specifically about having one of these conversational agents in a hospital setting, because uh, speaking of uh, speaking of laws and regulations, the GDPR uh, is very much about protecting how individual personal data is uh, treated and protected. Has this been an issue that has been discussed in implementing this type of robot that can talk to people about their health condition? Right. Um, I mean, it has been for in this particular case for Isolde, we haven't gotten to that stage yet. Simply, it's just a so far prototype. But uh, of course, these issues are, are always important in any form of conversational agent or actually in any technology that involves some for, form of surveillance. I mean, if you're talking to someone, you can, of course, store the conversation in principle. Um, and same thing if you have these systems that monitor. Uh, whether a person falls, perhaps you have a camera, uh, and all those things are, of course, very sensitive and, and require that one takes these things into account. Um, so, well, it's a, it's a very important issue, but in the case of Isolde specifically, we, we haven't really gotten to that stage yet. Hmm. I suppose it's upcoming if you get into practical applications. I think there's there's one thing that I uh, I suppose you'll have to use your imagination a bit. But what are the success criteria for an application like Isolde or like a humanoid robot? What what would the like desired effect be of having them there? Well, of course, it depends on the application. But if we're talking about uh, healthcare, what we are hoping to achieve is something that could alleviate a little bit or help uh, the healthcare staff with mundane simple tasks right so what we are not trying to do is in any way to replace human care absolutely not right so, so the robot would only do these very basic tasks and thereby freeing up time for healthcare professionals uh, i mean humans to do the things that humans do best i mean uh, uh, anything involving empathy and, and interacting with patients whereas these very basic things uh, that moving th things about or just taking a temperature measurements uh, that a robot can equally well do. That's what we are trying to achieve. Hmm. Okay, and just as a kind of wrap-up question, where did the name Isolde come from? Uh, well, it's uh, it's an acronym for something I can't really remember uh, at the moment. Uh, I can I can look it up. Okay, uh, it's an acronym for um, what was it? Uh, uh, let's see, interactive system for social distancing or something of that sort. Okay. Yeah. I suppose those who would want to mo know more will have to Google. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Or you're welcome to contact me if you like. Excellent. Thank you very much, Matthias. Great. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, that almost concludes our um, first afternoon session. Uh, I think it was a great collection of speeches from uh, Minna and then Andreas and Sara and finally Matthias. Again, we've learned a lot. Before we go to uh, the coffee break, we would like to hand over the hosting of the final section to uh, Torbjörn Lund. So please join us at the stage. Hi, Thank Torbjörn. You. How are you? you? I'm fine. Fine. Yeah. Thank you. Sounds I'm great. eager to get started. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> lovely. Uh, so Torbjörn will host our final session on, uh, with emphasis on collaboration. Yes, how to foster collaboration yes. is a general exactly. topic. Mm -hmm. Thanks for setting the stage, and uh, both physically and, 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 and atmospherically. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for adding new energy. It's, uh, it's been a fun day, but it's also good to have someone new with you know, a fresh yeah, start in right. the middle like that. So? But, uh, but you will stay and act as uh, active you know, audience here, I guess, for... Oh, we'll yeah. do that. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so it's time for a uh, leg stretcher, a coffee, uh, water, whatever. And then we will be back here at quarter past again. Thank you for now.